Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to our final live session of Avid Online for this year, 2020. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, a special welcome to you. Uh, please refer to the chat box for more information on Avid Learning, the work that we do, and our wonderful partners uh, for this evening. And for those who have been tuning in throughout the year, thank you for staying with us through this journey as we transitioned online. As we look back on this year, it's been a, certainly been a challenging one for all of us, and yet Avid Learning has brought, it's brought us tremendous opportunity to innovate for the times and continue with the work that we believe in. In fact, in 2020, Avid Learning presented over 230 programs, and over the last nine months um, across Avid Online, our digital further learning campaign, and uh, Mumbai uh, premiere at Mumbai Opera, we curated and presented uh, close to 200 programs across 14 campaigns and four series. Uh, we're so proud to have uh, uh, and humbled to have uh, you know successfully leveraged the digital medium. Um, to do our part to support the creative community and maintain a continuous dialogue with our audiences. And, um, you know, this would not have been possible without our audiences who keep coming back, tuning in for our live sessions or logging on to our YouTube uh, channel for our pre-recorded videos, giving truth to our mantra that learning never stops. And as we approach 2021, we, we endeavor to scale to new heights and continue to spread the positivity of the arts to up uplift, educate, and inspire our community. And that brings us to our evening session. Himanshu Shet Photog Photo Safaris and Avid Learning present Art and Aesthetic of Black and White Photography, an illuminating live masterclass with photographer Himanshu Chandrakant Shet. For more about him, please refer to his very impressive bio that has been pasted in the chat section. Um, and, you know, uh, Himanshu has been one of Avid's oldest supporters. And over the past 11 years since Avid started, I mean, we've done uh, workshops, masterclasses with Himanshu I, in more than a handful of times. I mean, I don't even know how many times at this point, you know, we used to have pack sessions at SR House or Himanshu studio. Um, so it's very, it's very um, uh, special to have him uh, back um, for our closing session for uh, for this year. Uh, thank you, Himanshu, for the continued support. And, you know, in this session, Himanshu will dwell into the various techniques and, and creative approaches specific to black and white photography, drawing from his vast experience in the field across portraiture and lifestyle. He will examine the fundamentals as, we um, as well as the finer creative artistic nuances involved in capturing that perfect monochrome shot. Uh, as far as the format goes, uh, Himanshu will be uh, speaking and presenting um, for about 75 minutes, followed by uh, a Q&A of 15 minutes. Himanshu will be taking questions, so please start posting them in the Q&A box. Um, on that note, thank you once again for tuning in. Um, over to you, Himanshu. Look, I look forward to a fascinating session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asad. Thank you so very, very, very much. Uh, always a pleasure. I know if we, if we started in 2009, I started my photo safaris in 2009. And, um, you know, we've, we've strongly been associated with each other ever since. So, yeah, a huge, huge thank you again. Um, yeah, coming, coming to today's session. Um, yeah, we are definitely delving into black and white, which is one of my favorite areas of photography, especially with my travels. And um, yeah, um, can I share my PowerPoint? Uh, excellent. Okay. So without wasting too much time, I'm just going to jump right into it. Since we're going to talk a lot about photography and a lot about black and white photography uh, specifically. So um, I've tried to keep it as light and you know as, as simple and definitely visual heavy. So uh, you'll see images from uh, my various travels over the years and uh, showcasing that, maybe speak a little bit of that as we go along. Um, but uh, like I said, rightly pointed out, we're going, to, we're going to delve into the fundamentals of, of black and white uh, photography primarily. Um, given the stipulated time, I guess that's, that's more or less what we do. And of course, we'll be talking about all the other aspects as well in terms of uh, compositions, in terms of you know, what do you see and how do you see things and things like that and how do you identify subjects and all of that. 
So, <clears throat> black and white photography. Now, it is a unique artistic medium. And why is it artistic? Because its images are abstract. They often represent but never duplicate in the real world. Now, what does that mean? That means that the lack of color um, will always make it not exactly the same as your eye sees it. And therefore, the abstraction starts the moment you start taking pictures in black and white. So colors are shown primarily in gradations of gray tones. Now, these tones obviously can be expanded um, uh, or compressed. What that means is expanded means you see from black to white and a lot of the various shades of grays in between and compressed is more of the blacks, the dark grays, the whites and the, and the, and the lighter whites. Now, but what appears to be a limitation is actually a greater freedom to interpret the world around us. Now, black and white photography is, of course, language of the senses. Now, viewing a black and white photograph provides a sensual experience that defies verbal description. Now, obviously, uh, color has its place, undoubtedly. But the moment you switch the image to black and white, it just takes a completely different mood, a completely different feel, and speaks a completely different language. So now these are just classic um, classic shot of the sand dunes of Namibia. Um, I mean, the, the color shots, of course, are, are fairly standard. I'm sure most of you have seen enough of those. But the moment you convert this, it's, it's, just, it's just sheer poetry. Just the way the lines and the forms and the shape moves around is just fantastic. So I'll, I'll talk more as we go along when we come to composition and you know, the force of the diagonal lines and how they move around. But now also black and white photography, it is intensely personal and depends for effect on the psychology, culture and experience of the viewer, which may be vastly different from other viewers and all the photographer himself. Now, for example, like the uh, work and the sculptures on the Khajurao temples, I mean, each one goes there, views them, some take art, some take poetry out of it. And, you know, each one each one depicts and sees it in their own way and uh, depending on their own reality and their own life experiences. So it pretty much is uh, very, very personal how you view any any art, or any, any images for that matter. Now, photography portraits, it depicts the environment and the elements that reside within. So when, once you pick up the camera and look through the viewfinder, what you what what you put in that rectangle once you once you look through it is entirely in your control. So we we may want to show the environment that we are in, we may want to show just a part of it and not so much. You wanted to make it abstract, leave it to the imagination side. Um, so it's entirely up to you. This is uh, an image taken in the black desert in, in Egypt. And uh, it's, it's, it's just a barren landscape and you don't see a soul on, on this side of the world. And it's amazing. I mean, Egypt is, is stunning in its historical monuments and architecture and the temples and the pyramids and all of that. But uh, very few actually go to these parts, you know, the, the black desert, they have the white desert and they have something called the Valley of the Waves. Now, I'll delve into it as we move forward and we see more examples of these places. But um, yeah, I mean, black and white does just the normal justice to these landscapes. Now, with increased control, the photographer tends, uh, extends the range of his vision. His decisions create a unique image rather than a direct representation. Now, what does that mean? Now, just, just to elaborate this point, I've, I've put down three images over here. Again, this is part of the white desert in Egypt. Uh, which I took last year. Now, the bottom, the color image is pretty much as, as I saw it. It's the early morning uh, golden light. And uh, that, that's exactly how we saw it. Uh, if you look at the top um, left-hand image on your screens, um, that's more or less a direct representation of what it was. But it still already speaks a completely different mood and a completely different feel. Now, further to that, now when we say uh, with increased control, the photographer can extend the range of his vision. Now, when, when we are saying that, what we, are, what we are trying to say is that all the development that technology has brought to us in, in the field of photography. Now, we would, we would do all of this in the dark room, and it probably took hours and sometimes days to achieve a particular, a particular contrast range and a particular kind of print that we wanted to achieve. Now, today, 
that dark room has shifted onto your screens and the software has become your dark room and uh, there's just so much that you can achieve if you if you just know how to how to play with those tools and uh, that's the final interpre interpretation of the image in color on on the top right and if you see um, i have increased the contrast and i have kind of reduced the overall exposure just a tad bit and increased the contrast by just doing that all i'm doing is focusing on the main elements and reducing the other details and the image picks out a lot more contrast and suddenly the mood is very very different so um, now again this this is also a lot of experience when you when you travel a lot and you uh, use the camera for over 20 years it becomes very easy for me to say that oh this is the way it is but um, but yeah i mean um, the more the more you use your camera the more you st uh, step out and take pictures and and get in the habit of playing with your software which is earlier we used to play in the dark room and um, so now the more you play with the software the the quicker and faster you will learn and you will adapt that much better so what happens is that when i when i look at an image and um, i know okay this is this is a pretty picture and sometimes a picture is not that great and can probably translate better um, as a black and white image for that you need to be seeing in black and white in your mind's eye so um, well in the earlier days of course we didn't have that luxury on, on film uh, but today all all cameras have a black and white mode so if you're shooting in raw it will still capture color but um, you can actually see the picture in black and white that's one of the simplest uh, and the easiest uh, hacks to kind of see what the image might look in black and white but uh, nothing will give you the the level of accuracy and the level of um, um, vision that you want to translate um, more than practicing in in the various software that are available now just to elaborate that point now if you look at this particular picture i've shown you i've shown it in color now this line is just absolutely in mara this was shot last year uh just lazing in the in the evening light and uh, completely overcast so there was no direct sunlight coming down now um you know i mean normally i mean i have got plenty of pictures like this and i wouldn't have really even bothered taking a shot but when i when i saw this land is lying down like this the first thing that came to me was black and white and the reason um why i thought black and white is if you if you notice that the entire outline the the belly the chest you know the chin all of that is absolutely bright white and then it gradually goes into the browns and darker browns or the lines and then of course the green so now if you if you look we can we can separate color over here but the greens and the browns are pretty much similar tones if you if you can see in black and white and the highlight that that we see all along the body is what grabbed my eye and the moment i saw this lion is lying there and i could see the contrast and i was literally visualizing it in black and white and i said okay i, I know i'm what i'm going to do i'm going to play with the contrast here heavily and uh, and translate this image into black and white and so here's the here's the result so uh, so if you if you see what's happened right so because i was looking out at the highlight and i knew that in black and white i have far greater control over the contrast than i have in color so when i play with that that's what i end up getting so now it's just the highlight that which caught my eye is the only thing that i'm showing and um, that's that's what black and white can do now a similar case right here and the photographer chooses to mirror the scene it is his wish to do so and if he departs from the scene it is his need to discover an alternative world in reality now this image was taken um, in ecuador we were we were uh, um, at the amazon forest and um, you know uh, the only way to our uh, resort and out was via a boat and through those little canals that are there in all along the amazon basin and uh, so this is nothing but the reflection of the forest um, in the water and uh, again i i looked at this image the reflection looks fantastic i mean the image by itself it is nice i mean it almost looks very painterly and it's got that feel um however again if you if you notice now again this is all about how you try to see things uh, and visualize it in black and white um what you're looking out for is contrast and this image if you see the two white lines of the trees the longer ones and then a few subordinate ones 
they're all nice and bright white compared to the rest of the image. And the moment you see that, you know, okay, this might translate into an interesting image in black and white. And uh, that's, that's the thought process even before I take the picture. And like I said, this is, this is nothing but, but just a lot of practice. And uh, that's all I would advocate. I mean, the more you practice, the quicker you learn. And uh, so that's it. So that's, that's my observation. I see this, I take this picture as is. I think it, it's, it's fine as is as well. But then I convert it into black and white. And then it just takes a completely different mood, completely different feel. The contrast plays out so much more strongly. And it just looks like an abstract piece of art. So, and this is, this is uh, no great shape, Photoshop, trickery, nothing. It is only playing with the contrast. That's all, that's all I'm doing in most of the images that you will see here. If there is anything else uh, more I've done, I will, I will let you know. But mostly it's just converting to black and white and just playing with the various types of contrasts that are available. Now again, black and white photography is definitely not a poor cousin to color. It is a discriminating tool for those who are visually sophisticated. Yeah, I think I, I definitely agree with this one. Um, um, again, if you, if you look at this picture, it's, it's a really pretty picture. I, I quite like it. I mean, you know, the, the whole interplay of the lines, the shadow of the leaves. So the repetition, the pattern, the design, all that, the texture, everything coming through quite nicely. And as, as a color image, it's fantastic. I don't have a problem with that. And the moment you turn this into black and white, it just takes a whole different meaning. So it just becomes so much more sensual. So I, I just, uh, yeah. So now, now I hope you realize, you know, and, and can see uh, why black and white is so, so dear to me. So it, I mean, this, this is, this is nice. This is nice, but this just takes a whole different meaning. So, yeah. So coming, you know. So hopefully we, we've kind of cleared that out. You know, why, why. Uh, black and white is fairly unique in its imagery from color and how it can differentiate and stand its own ground very, very well. Um, and you don't have to have color and dominating that. And, you know, black and white, I, I personally feel it's, it's a fantastic art form. Now, coming to today's main topics is what I'm going to discuss is all these fundamental characteristics for the black and white image. Now, black and white is a designer's tool, essentially it's caress. Now, denying the apparent reality of color, it begins as an abstract representation. So the moment you take color out, you're forced and you're compelled to see things um, in tones, in tones of blacks, whites, and grays. So the moment you're in, in that space, you've already abstracted your reality. Now, we dwell into some of the attributes important to black and white imagery, including designing with dark and light tones, termed chiaroscuro, Patterns and textures, tonal range and compositional elements, which will help heighten the impact of our state. So the, the more important ones from plenty of them that are available in photography is a chiaroscuro, especially for black and white, is chiaroscuro, contrast, high key, low key, and then we come to line, shape, form, and texture. So it can be said that each artistic medium has unique advantages and corresponding disadvantages. Now, monochrome photography combines an impressive array of strengths and uh, honestly, a surprising lack of weaknesses. Its main strength lies actually in its weakness and which is it doesn't show color. So now you are, you are forced to interpret everything in tones and uh, in monochrome and, and that, that just forces you to see life and, and the canvas in a completely different way. So starting with chiaroscuro. It's designing with lights and darks. The word chiaroscuro is derived from Italian roots, chiaro meaning light and oscuro meaning dark. Now we have two dictionary meanings. One, a pictorial representation in terms of light and shade without regard for color. And two, the arrangement of light and dark parts in a pictorial part. Now though the term was coined for art and design, it have easily been coined for monochrome which itself is a pictorial representation in terms of light and dark without regard for any color. The monochrome photographs may have an infinite variety of tones or merely a few. Like in this particular image, you're seeing very few tones. You're seeing a very stark white line, uh, predominantly a lot of dark gray and black, and with just a few shades of gray. So it does not have a very, very huge variety of tones. 
Whereas within the boundaries of the picture frame, there is bound to be some interaction of light and darkness. This interaction can provide balance or imbalance, tenseness or tranquility, drama or mystery, logic or calculated insanity. So again, if you see that always whenever you take pictures, um, and especially when you convert them to black and white, there will always be a huge interplay of tones. Um, sometimes the tones will just be clubbed into one side where, where the picture will be very bright and, and bright tone heavy and some might be very dark tone heavy. But seldom you'll find an image which uh, lacks either or, however small it may be. So you may have a predominantly dark image and have a bright patch in there or vice versa. So that is what black and white would do. Now knowing how exposure and software processing along with printing, enables the artist to visualize the scene in the viewfinder, subconsciously juggling the areas of light and dark for the desired effect. Now, forecasting how the scene will appear in gray tones should help tighten the composition and heighten the impact. Now, again, if you, if you look at the picture that I'm, I'm showing you here, I'm showing you two examples of the same shot. Now, um, the color image was pretty much very, very similar to the image on, your, on the left of your screen. Um, where, you're, where you're seeing the water is um, light gray and the elephants stand out pretty much like silhouettes. Now that's because the sun was behind and um, in, in the color image it's just that the, the water is slightly brown in color and that's the only difference. Otherwise it's pretty much similar. Um, so when I'm taking this picture I'm already visualizing black and white because the elephants are silhouettes thanks to the sun being behind them. So and even the actual image was was pretty close to what you're seeing on the left hand side of your screens. Now, again, when I'm seeing it, I know instantly when I'm seeing it that, yeah, this definitely calls for a really, really high contrast uh, treatment in, 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 on the computer in post. And uh, that's exactly what we've, we've come, come up to. And uh, if you see the image on the right hand side, there, all I've done is increase the contrast. And I don't really care about the details of the little, uh, you know, water waves and stuff in the background and the foreground. And I've reduced them quite a lot by increasing the contrast. And the blacks have only gotten more black and the dark grays have gotten black as well. So the contrast is just, just shot up a lot. But in, in terms of an image, I, I personally, again, prefer the one on the right because of its extreme contrast. So now the photographer is left to decide. What, once you understand what's available to you and what the image can do for you, it becomes very easy for you to to sit and decide, okay, this is how I want my final image to look like. So there's no right and wrong. There are lots of people who may like the image more on the, on the left and some may like the ones on the right. So again, that's, that's very, very personal. Um, but uh, I'm just trying to show you what, what options can be available to you. So a contrasty print may very well use a simple arrangement for handed power. So the moment you get into high contrast, you are actually playing a lot more with shapes, as you can see here. Again, part of the White Desert series um, in Egypt. And um, so this is, this is the actual formation. It almost looks like a mushroom and a hen. Um, and this is what it's called. Um, and uh, the sun is setting behind it. So obviously the, the, the formations go into a silhouette with these little, little stray clouds in the sky and uh, definitely call for a great black and white shot. So again, just converting it, playing with the contrast a little bit, and uh, honestly, the shapes just stand out. And that little burst of, of light on, on the, on the left-hand bottom side just adds and, and gives you a sense of what the time of day is. Now, complex image with smooth gradation of tones will lend itself to a more subtle style. So now you can see over here, it's not only blacks and whites, and you have a lot of grays in between as well. So that, again, now you get a lot more detail in an image, and you, and you can see the pyramids are a lot darker. This guy sitting here, he's got, a, you can see just that light coming from the sun, just, you know, kind of brightening a part of his face. Most of it is a little bit in the dark, but you can also see the entire environment, how much sand is there from here, the depth you can perceive, all of that. And if I had gone high contrast, you'd only see two black figures, the pyramids and the guy sitting here, and everything would have probably got washed out. So extremely high or low key represented uh, representation should be adaptable to simple arrangements. So again, it, it's very similar to uh, high contrast, low contrast. So um, a high key image is more bright and we'll come to that. But so again, whenever you are in the extremes or you're playing with contrast, you want to keep your subject dominating. And 
not too many other things taking away or disturbing from your subject and that's that's most important so again this is evening light the king just walking across the air strip that was there this is in masai mara again and uh, he literally just walked past this little patch of light that was just coming through and it just created a beautiful rim light so even the color looks fantastic in this but, but black and white is just really cool now intermediate long range scenes will permit complexity finally it is worth repeating that chiaroscuro is only one consideration in picture design it must function with knowledge of all the other elements that will make a final print so here in this particular image you can see the various tones so you can see a little bit of black you see a little, a little bit of white and but you see a lot of grays and uh, it's just a representation of what the actual scene was and yet it's so so different from what the real scene was because color takes it a completely different uh, language and black and white speaks a completely different language okay so then we come to after kiaros we are going to talk about contrast well or black and white um is inevitably in black and white photography now um, if i had to really really um, pick on one thing that that sums up black and white photography and i've just been constantly repeating and harping on that word and that is contrast so color photography has little provision for the control of contrast but black and white offers a wide range of tolerance which in turn gives immense contrast control so if you look at this picture um shot in namibia uh, one of the most incredible landscapes uh, in the world and um, you see these massive sand dunes you see on the right they literally end into the atlantic ocean and uh, so this is uh, a place called the sandwich harbor and you can only access this place um, when it's low tide it's it's only then uh, that the vehicle can actually drive on the sand and and reach a particular spot and you got to get out of here before it's high tide or you can have fun because then you have to literally drive through these giant sand dunes and head back to town so it's it's quite an incredible journey and quite an experience um so again if you look at the color you know there's fog i mean it's it's sort of mood and it's it's a nice image in color as well but the moment we convert to black and white and if we can play with the contrast just a tad bit the whole mood changes so much more so if you look at the black and white and you look at the color yeah to me the black and white is enough so you know how how deep the sky gets the fog gets a lot more intense you know the, the people standing the silhouettes everything just just starts getting so much more stronger so and then okay this is an example of the lack of contrast which is very little contrast it's just very very slow soft gradation of contrast and again all these classic images you know where you see layers and layers and layers just separated by very very little Now, contrast is also one of the most foremost variables in the medium and one that has great influence on the emotional impact of the print now this particular image believe me no no arguments here it's it's the black and white that really really stands out so strong it's got this whole crunch look and feel to it and it makes it so powerful the color is just very very pale and really not what talking about now high contrast low contrast all of the moderate stages in between allow the photographer to evoke a mood of the sensation now um if you look at this picture overall if you if you look at the backdrop if you look um, at the foreground the background it's very soft it's very still it's very very pleasant soothing calming and then you have this burst of energy in this giraffe is just kind of running through the landscape and uh, fortunately i got a good moment there with with the legs half in air the tail flying out and uh, just kind of worked beautifully contrasting the whole ambience of the place and again so it's 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 contrast in in the mood and uh, also the way the tones play out you know so the all the tones are really really soft all over the background and then the moment you see the the, the giraffe and it just contrasts out and jumps out the image so when deciding how to record a scene the photographer must consider contrast and it's considerable influence on the statement now for instance what is the contrast of the scene will the scene be more appropriately portrayed as high contrast low contrast or somewhere in between or in the so called normal range 
how should it be modified should you should you do it at the shooting stage should you be doing it at the processing and the software stage or maybe a bit of both so again um this again all comes down to um, you know how how uh, proficient you are at using um, your camera you uh, controlling your exposure that's that's your starting point and with black and white definitely um I, I lay a lot of emphasis on experience uh, purely because the more you start seeing in black and white and today with digital photography as i said earlier you have the option of converting everything to black and white and and seeing it that way so if that helps though i'm i'm not a great fan i mean to, for starters i think that's fantastic but um, i i really don't rely too much on that because when i convert to black and white on screen the 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 image looks kind of sort of flattish it does not give me the range of contrast that you're seeing in all these pictures now for that you definitely need to practice a lot more with the softwares uh that come that come with your camera is as simple as that and um, the more you play with that the more you will realize how much you can play with these contrasts so um but yes definitely converting to black and white just just to see it definitely definitely helps so now high contrast prints may relate a sensation of activity intensity and expectancy by strictly confining the viewer's attention to critical scene elements non essential details are eliminated by deep shadows or very dark highlights so if you look at this image honestly there is there's really the, the most important thing are the words you know on this wall and the one that's taking off so of course the wall um in the original color image has a lot of detail on the wall there's a lot of probably should an ornate you know typical as as you would in anywhere you go in india and you'll see these walls just lying around with so much muck on it so it was that and there were lots of egrets um on the wall and uh, constantly you know a few flying out a few landing in and they're just coming going coming going and i had obviously had to wait a long long hour and i spent almost an hour at this place um and just trying to figure you know where what would make a great shot and kept waiting kept waiting till i finally managed to get this so i've got i've got some shots where there's a there about three four different birds you know either landing or taking off together and all but i thought this one was among the most powerful with all of them just waiting in line and this one's just taking off so um and of course i mean the, the treatment when when we converted to black and white again in this image was backlit so the sun was behind the birds therefore they were already in a in a bit of a silhouette and uh, but because the eagles are white in color they were not as dark as you see them here and that's all thanks to playing with contrast so the moment you play with contrast under expose a little bit the wall lost all detail is just a nice black patch which literally goes in a in a diagonal and kind of divides the frame and then you have the top half where the birds are just waiting and watching in this one state so yeah so it's again again a lot to do with how you can see in black and white so again same thing right here this little duckling is just in in the in the this was at kejaria bird sanctuary in in jamnagar and um, yeah again it's just it's a very simple picture but it's just the high contrast all i've done is play with the contrast so i've lost a lot of the detail on the water which i thought is not essential and yet you have these few ripples which kind of go in this whole circular movement which you know are created by the duckling and its movement so it's just that much and just these little grass shoots hanging out and the duck over there so again it's just you know it's the color image does not do half as much justice as this one does the moment you convert to black and white and play with contrast now it is also possible to find the somber representation of a subject affected with high contrast so this was shot long long time ago in in australia when i was finishing my studies after my studies and i was traveling back back in that's when i took this shot so um it's um on the eastern coast and one of the longest stretches of the beach over there and they barely have any population so when we came to the spot i was in this with this group and uh, it was only us on this entire stretch of the beach so you come onto the beach you look on the left nothing till the horizon it's just the beach extending all the way there you go on to look on to the right exactly the same and not a soul inside so the drama is created by the sky again the 
contrast again it's a high contrast uh, image the the scene itself was fairly uh, contrasty and then with black and white conversion and playing with the contrast you just kind of push that a little bit more and it just becomes even that much more dramatic so closely grouped narrow range of tones can impart calm moody static atmosphere so if you look at this particular image um, the contrast is very very low yet the only area which which kind of jumps and creates that little contrast is the door that's the darkest part of the frame otherwise it's just in the mid grays and a little slight dark gray at the top of the sky and the rest is it's just so muted in terms of its uh, range of tones and so only that one tone that really really stands out so just a little bit of contrast in the overall uh, narrow range of tones can also create such strong impact now an apparently normal or moderate range of tones offers the involved spectator's viewpoint the technique is carefully subordinated to the subject so that the print strictly represents the actual scene so if you see here you got your whites you got your blacks and you got a lot of the other tones in between now when you're seeing something like this now for me when i when i was when i saw this and you know just to see these antique switches and uh, regulators and the fuse i mean you know i i don't remember seeing these kind of fuses since maybe you're a really 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 kid really and uh, this is one of the palaces in gujarat that uh, we were fortunate to conduct a photo safari at and uh, i mean honestly you don't really want to do much to it is just literally the box there and it is literally a direct representation of what it was is just not in color and it's in black and white that's the only difference but but literally it is in terms of lighting contrast the way we saw it so after contrast we talked about high key and low key now key refers to the overall tonal appearance of a print in a high key image light tones dominate and in a low key image dark tones dominate so i hope that's fairly clear now the moment you anybody refers to saying oh that's a high key shot so when you're saying high key what what you're trying to say is that there's a predominance of white and light colors and when you say it's oh it's a very low key shot we're talking about dark black to dark colors so it's the image is a lot heavier either in in darker side or the brighter side now this particular image obviously no guesses is more on the high key whereas this one clearly represents low key so just a little spot of highlight there and that just makes the image that much more pop so photographs with tones grouped high or low have a direct influence on the overall mood of the image high key images tend to broadcast an ethereal cheerful weightless atmosphere as in the case of these tweets now low key photos dark and gloomy speak of the reverse earthbound melancholy so they they create a completely different kind of a mood in the look and feel so the logical assumption that high key or low key photos would be low in contrast is also quite false in a high key image a dark shadow or subject helps to establish credibility now here my my subject was the reflection of the giraffe in water um and again it's just playing with the contrast here to just increase in height so it's a high key image with the subject being fairly dark or in a low key photo as in this one so it's predominantly low key with just a shaft of light it improves the viewer's ability to relate to the unusual scene to his own sense of reality so and this also comes in that same space so it's fairly low key with just the sun right there in the middle just kind of highlighting contrast then we talk about line shape form and texture which will probably help in in the composition of the images and how you start seeing things more in black and white and how these uh, elements kind of help to improve your black and white imagery so having described some of the unique features of monochrome photography we will take a brief look at some of the more common image making concepts of line shape form and texture now lines define and separate they help determine de uh, determine distance and establish relationships so if you see the lines will always separate things now if you if you look at the entire canvas is the lines that's literally breaking the canvas into different different parts and um, of course you're playing with contrast again and you can see all you're seeing is just the lines and nothing else so in black and white photography lines can be black white or gray lines 
They may be sharp and contrasty, as in the butt of a zebra or the entire body for that matter. Or they may be diffuse and subtle, like in this cloud. So the structure of a photograph often includes lines, straight or curved, that tie elements of the picture together. The shape has a line for perimeter and is often filled in. So if you really talk about shape, the, the best way and the only way to identify shape is by a line outlining the entire shape. So if you look at this uh, particular image, this is um, the kind of artwork that you would see typically in a Kutch village. Um, we saw a lot of this when we were dri driving it through uh, one of my Kutch photo safaris. Um, they have these mud houses and what they do for decoration, they take leaves and flowers and stuff like that and they stick it on their mud walls when they're being made. So they stick to the wet mud and as the wet mud dries up, the leaf dries up, the flowers dry up and then slowly, slowly they fall off, leaving the impression behind and that's exactly what you're seeing. So and it, it, it just looks stunning and, and all the surrounding area which forms this outline around the leaf. Now shapes are important because we recognize a universe of subjects by shapes alone. So a shape can be massive, ephemeral, large or small, dark or light. Again, an example of the white desert. Now a recognizable shape can provide the comfort of familiarity. This is again from that same elephant series, this is in Samburu, where the elephants were crossing the river. A strange shape can create mystery or tension. Intense, dark or light shapes may be more dramatic than shapes in mid -tones. So um, I have this habit of, uh, you know, whenever I'm flying and traveling and flying uh, in planes, I always take the window seat. And more often than not, I always have the camera with me. And I love shooting clouds uh, from the little window and also the landscape, sometimes the landscape can be quite stunning and you get this whole aerial perspective which can be quite stunning. Uh, provided of course the, the, the glass on, on the window is fairly clean. So I always sit there and the first thing I do is I take tissue and I really give it a good scrub, clean it all up and then wait for takeoff and then uh, start shooting whatever I get to see. And this is yeah one, one of these great cloud shots that we capture while flying. Now, silhouettes are shapes. Brilliant highlights can be shapes. Shadows can also be shapes. So, if you can see, this is clearly, I mean, the, the, the headlight of the vehicle behind this guy has thrown a nice outline. And the, because it's in the nighttime, the camera is shaken a little bit and it's given you know, multiple lines coming around it. It just makes the image that much more interesting. Yep, again. Yeah just lines and the contrast that just shows you shape. Shadows can show you shape as well. And then we come to form. Form is the name given to the impression of depth provided by transition from light to dark on a single object. So as we all know, your know, photographs are two dimensional and you do not really see the third dimension and we have to rely on the way the light and the shadow falls to give us the third dimension of form. Now, if you look at, look at this image and you see the light coming from the, right hand, uh, the left hand side of the screen onto the right hand side of the face and then the way as the face is away from the light, you can see how it's really going from you know, a light gray tone to an absolute almost black on the other end. Now the moment the light falls from that kind of a spectrum of tones, you tend to see form. So if I were to light this absolutely flat from front and give you a straight shot, you would not see the depth that you can perceive in this particular image. Yeah, the famous rocks of Humpy. Um, so the transition of light is more, when the transition of light is more gradual, textural detail is discernible over a broader range of shadows and highlight areas which intensifies the impression of depth and mass. So now if you look, if you look at this particular image, uh, you know the, the, the sun is, is on the left hand side of the screen, which is on the right hand side of the boulder. And the right hand side of the screen is slowly going into shadow. 
and of course below the border is absolutely pitch black so having highlight detail and shadow detail so you can see the texture all the way from the brighter part all the way into the shadow areas and that definitely gives you a much broader range and a much larger impression of depth and mass so the same applies here so you can see the way how the shadows and the highlights are playing out and the detail on them and the texture that you see and again this is again one of my uh, crazy images because this is a tree it's called a ghost tree this is shot in gear and um, this particular tree um i don't know how many can see this but i mean when you look at the the, the three branches that that are you know coming out of the tree they almost looks like look like three dancing figures i don't know whether you get that impression it will that it certainly looks that way to me and uh, you know I've, i've been to gish several times and i've seen this tree almost every trip that i've gone there. just to just to see if i could you know get a different take on the tree and believe me though only time you get this whole feeling of these three figures literally emanating out of the tree is at this late afternoon so this picture was taken around i think close to 4:30 the afternoon and that's the only time when the sun is at a particular height in the sky when you get these shadows and therefore the form takes this kind of a shape so i've i've gone there early in the morning i've taken the morning drive and you know visited this tree at about 9 a.m. and it looks nothing like this because the dining is fully lit and you really don't see any of this so it's the shadows that you know create the form on on most of his objects again same same thing right here so you see how how the brighter parts and the and and the tonal variation and how the dark parts come in that that gives you the whole you know the volume and the mass that comes across this is obviously shavan bilgula and my soul and then we talk about texture now texture is the word that describes the tactile impression of the surface it is one of the sign posts that photographers use to signify form ah so the great migration uh, shot last year you can see just just is just a whole sea of texture so you get this just intense textures of the horns right in the foreground almost halfway into the screen and then as the wildebeest start climbing up you get a little more smoother texture of of your backs as we, as they are making their way up sorry now texture can be rough as you see on the elephant's butt or smooth as this beach can tell you lighting also can create texture the irregular surface is broken into minute areas of light and dark so again you know, as as the as the um, either mornings or evenings when we say say around the morning say from 8 o'clock to say about 8 uh, 10 10 30 and in the evening maybe say around from 4ish till about 6 uh when the light the, the sun is coming closer to the horizon that's when you see maximum texture and maximum detail on surfaces because since the light is low and it cuts across at that angle you really get to see so much more texture So if the sun was right on top of this flower you would definitely not see it the way you're seeing it right now it's just the interplay of light and shade because of the way the light is filtering through and the diffuse light of a less contrasty situation can bring out detail in a smoother texture so you know this little boy skin you look at the water water is fairly smooth and um, if this was in very bright light that water would have got washed out you wouldn't have been able to see the texture and the way it's falling down so those are the main areas or uh, uh, the fundamentals that really uh, play a very very important uh, role in black and white photography um having said that there are also other principles of composition that are equally effective for color and black and white photography now one of the simplest ones is frame within a frame so absolutely classics sorry this this particular one was taken on the eastern parts of turkey um and this obviously is istanbul people are familiar this is reflections of the 
Manhattan skyline seen from Jersey. I think it's the, the post office building literally across um, the river. And uh, they have these lovely windows over there. And this is literally the reflection. So you're just literally seeing, it's literally framed into each window. So you see the reflection of the Manhattan skyline in all these little windows. And yeah, this is in Oman, one of the oldest, um, I can't remember how many years old, but this is a fairly old mud village over there. Then of course the classic filling the frame. So filling your frame with your, with your main subject. Now to fill the frame with a subject of central interest, we move closer or change to a longer from length length. So when you go really close, and especially when, if, you, if you are just starting out in photography, this would be one of the simplest principles to start with. So once you identified your subject, the, the simplest thing to do is come as close to your subject as possible. The closer you go, the more you eliminate any kind of distractions that can take away the concentration from your main subject. Definitely not the most interesting way to photograph, but it definitely, at least your attention stays primarily on your subject and doesn't waver off somewhere else. So that really, really helps. Yeah, tribe in Namibia. So now this is slightly longer. And the reason it, I've taken a slightly more loser shot as compared to this one. Here you can see I've literally cropped the head and just above the middle of the neck. Whereas here you're seeing a lot more of the neck and the full head on the top is obviously to give you a sense of space, you know, what this woman is wearing around the neck, in the head, you know, the way her hair is braided, all of that. Um, this is Namibia again. And uh, also a slightly wider frame gives you a sense of space. You see that out of focus figure in the background. So it, it, it gives you a bit of an environment around the person as well. So classically termed as an environmental portrait. And portraits are not only of people. I mean, you can, you can shoot portraits of structures of sculptures and the the principle still remains the same try and go as close as possible and the same applies for wildlife as well so if you if you're going to shoot wildlife you're going to shoot your pets again try and fill the frame with them and that will make the image that much more interesting diagonal lines diagonals introduce dynamism into an image they activate the frame and also suggest movement along them so again like like contrast is for black and white for composition i'd say diagonals play a very very important part so the moment you have a diagonal it just it just energizes the frame so much more see that the power of these lines just taking you literally into the And you look at this picture. So, I mean, if you can visualize this, imagine this picture without this diagonal line that's going across. It would just be a simple, straightforward shot on the wall of this fort. But this diagonal line just adds a whole new dimension to the design and the way this image comes across. Perspective lines create depth in an image. As you can see the lines literally take you into the, into the frame. Again, the Namibia. And of course, the bottom of a palm leaf, all the lines, lines seem to converge towards one point. And architecture, of course. So it creates a lot of depth, all the pillar columns. Um, okay, this is a little uh, bit of an unusual image. What all I've done here is um, uh, this was shot on film uh, before digital era. And uh, this was shot on a transparency. I don't know if are familiar with it. It was a slide film. And then I have printed it in a black and white dark room. So it's a positive image that I've printed and it comes as a negative. So if you're familiar or if, if you've seen what a negative looks like, this is actually a negative which I've printed on here. And of course, again, the perspective lines in a spiral taking you right through. Now, symmetrical compositions signify solidity, stability, and strength. Symmetrical visual elements help present simplicity in an image. So, as you probably see a lot in architecture, you'll see a lot of symmetry in architecture. Um, rightly so, because you, you want to be standing on a, on a solid ground, and that's what uh, symmetry signifies. Solidity, stability, and strength. 
uh, this is the elephant caves rani ni wow in patan so again it's a it's a fascinating step well one of the most recent ones to be discovered fortunately because therefore the work on the walls is is so beautiful and so intact and uh, in this is on one of my photo safaris there to this place and uh, we managed to get special permission to to go because this place is not open to public this particular area and this image just makes it that much more special and once again so architecture bringing you symmetry and finally we come to the rule of thirds so the rule of thirds is a widely accepted aesthetic principle of photography you will get a much more aesthetically pleasing image if you place the subject of your photo a third of the way across the frame instead of in the center of the frame now what does that mean it means you basically divide the image into three parts horizontally and vertically now i've given you a, a, a rough uh, dotted line to to show that and wherever the lines intersect those are the golden points so if you have a main subject you want to put it in one of these points depending on the environment it is in or if you are shooting a landscape as is the case in this particular image you want it to go along your main subject to be along one of the lines so then you are trying to communicate and you show the environment and you keep the viewer engaged in the image so here of course you you seeing the gateway of india and i was blessed with a really dramatic sky um and of course you get a sense of the whole place what where it is so i placed it in the third vertical line that's where the gateway is and also part of it is in the golden point so therefore the image is so much more pleasing and and it communicates it shows you everything that's on the other side of the image again this is just a very simple graphic representation and again if you see it's along the vertical the vertical of this particular dome is tilted if you see the back one is absolutely straight but this one's tilted um but that's where i've placed right in the third of the vertical again so you want to bring your your horizon also close to where the line of the thirds is so here the horizon is a little close to the to the lower thirds and my balloon is pretty much in the vertical line over there so the moment you compose it in this fashion your pictures will definitely be far more aesthetically pleasing so you look at this the sphinx the eye of the sphinx is very very close to the golden point it's balanced with the pyramid on the left which is also in the vertical thirds and then in the lower third box you have the horses which is really really unusual i was really lucky to kind of get this kind of empty space and get the horses right there so you have to uh, you know i i saw them actually coming from a very very large distance i had no idea they would come here but you know i saw them coming they were coming towards the direction so i just chose to wait and um, see if they actually do come across and fortunately for me they actually did come this way and that's how i managed to get the shot so photography is a lot of anticipation a lot of waiting sometimes sometimes you get the shot sometimes you don't and that's what happens but you you try your best so though that's that's all about composition and then we're going to just i'm going to hit on a few points just on how does a photograph speak so when we when we are looking at an image and what are we looking at and you know why does a particular image speak to us so there are broadly three topics that come into consideration first and foremost is the design elements within the frame the arrangement of subject and contributing subordinate subject. So here, if you look at this particular shot, what are my subjects? My subject is the, of course, the herd of cows. The cow herd's right there. The sun in the background, that little line of cloud at the top. So it's all this. Now, how I compose, how I put it into frame is my choice. So from where I was actually standing first up, so this entire cow herd was literally coming towards me, and the sun was setting behind them. uh from where i was standing the sun was a little higher up it was not where you see it right now now i could not wait for the sun to come down because by then the cows would have just trampled all over me and gone ahead so what i had to do was get into position so i literally lay flat on the ground so i went really really low therefore 
the cow and the men have gone slightly higher on my horizon and the sun has managed to come behind them. So you get your position, you select what's in, in the frame and it forms a little diagonal, it's just the horns and of course because the sun is behind you get this lovely silhouette, high contrast and that's what makes it short. So same here. Yeah. So again, you just, you know, we, we were at this place again, uh, this is going from the black desert towards the white desert in Egypt and uh, stopped at all these places and you're just blessed to have cloud formation like this, almost looks like one of those ancient birds flying in the sky. And second is the tonal treatment that helps to establish the mood or emotion of the scene. Now, again, so if you, you would say whether this is a manipulated image, uh, yes, to an extent, yes. Um, there are two different shots. The, the boat was shot in Varanasi and the moon is shot there as well. Now, the moon is a separate shot, but whilst shooting this, I visualized in my head where I wanted to place the moon because on, and this is actually done on camera. It is not done in Photoshop or any other software. I can actually mix two images in my camera itself to give me a raw file. Now, this particular image is achieved in this manner. Uh, but to achieve it in this manner, I had to visualize it in my head beforehand. So I had to actually see it. I, I saw the board, I placed it. I already had the shot of the moon and I just had to figure the moment I saw the board, I knew exactly where to place it in the lower thirds so that the moon can come right above it. So, and then you get into the camera, you take those two raw files in camera and you mix them to achieve the final result. I mean, this can easily be done in Photoshop as well, but this was done on camera. And now you can see the tonal representation right here. So it's high contrast again, and it's got a lot of the mid-tones as well. And then finally we come to the mechanical choices of print size, paper surface, print presentation, by mounting or mapping and even frame. So the final display print arrives after a long sequence of interdependent decisions. It starts with seeing the subject. So now if you look at this particular image, um, what happens here is that uh, how we can just jump with you, right? Um, the man is so so small in this entire landscape. Now, if you take a if you take an image like this, and I've printed it, I've printed it on a small print, and zero impact. It really does no justice to this image. So a picture like this on screen looks fantastic because it is backlit, but on print it just gets lost if it's a small print. But when you print this large, when I say large, you're looking at you know, maybe as wide as about nine feet wide by or six feet high or five feet high. And suddenly the impact of this whole landscape just jumps at you. So that's the power of, uh, of you know, kind of seeing this because uh, these kind of images really do justice on a lot, much larger scale. Same, same goes for this particular one. Again, short in touch, uh, almost looks like the surface of the moon and uh, made this image so you see that really tiny little man right in the center over there, literally almost like all alone on this whole planet. And um, it works, it works fantastically when it's large. If I have a small print, I keep it away. People don't even notice or don't even realize, oh, what's going on. But the moment it's large, like a five feet wide print and boom, it just, it, it really, really hits you. So that's, that's the power of, you know, and, and this is something you, you want to decide you know, when you're shooting, you know, the impact is going to have. So all these decisions um, and all this only comes with practice. So the more you play with it, the more you get in the habit of, you know, maybe printing a few of your images every now and then, you you'll, you tend to understand, you know, what works really, really well, how it translates into a print. All that will pan out with more and more practice. So again, right here. Now, this is a print which uh, does not really require to be extremely large. However, a large print does have a much, much, much more powerful an impact. But um, this one, even a small print, really, really looks good. Anywhere you put it, anywhere in the house, and it looks fantastic. So the common areas of interest that drive people to take photographs, and the reason that people view photographs include landscape, portrait, candid, photojournalism, documentary, still life, nature, wildlife, architecture, so on and so forth, they, the, the list is endless. 
But of course, there is also an enormous body of work created for commercial, scientific, and industrial purposes. Now, what we are looking at is the rendition towards monochrome and what helps translate black and white into fine photography. So let's talk. Uh, I'm just obviously we are pressed for time, so I'm not going to really delve into so many of them. But just quickly talk about landscape and portrait here, as it has been photography's always favorite subjects. So at the beginning of photography, the greatest attention was paid to the mere faithful recording of the scene in front of you with all its detail. So earlier, every uh, image right in the beginning of photography, when the first cameras were you know, introduced, um, you could only, only shoot landscapes or maybe still life um, you know, tabletops. But you really couldn't shoot much more because uh, the exposures took hours um, if not like half an hour or sometimes an hour or two hours or three hours just to get one picture. So there's no way you could shoot people or any, anything that's moving or that's not static. So the landscapes were all time favorite. So after the wonder of photography's accuracy failed, it was replaced by the excitement of seeing reproductions of scenes taken by ambitious travel, travelers in obscure corners of the world. Again, this is an image of the white desert as I pointed out. And now you can actually see what it looks like. This is this is what it looks like. It's just literally a sand desert with just little white things popping out from the ground. Now, so people would travel and you know to all these crazy places and take pictures, and then it would you know excite others to kind of see those images and like, oh wow, I would really want to go here and I want to experience this and maybe take a picture of that. So that's how it started. So from from straightforward reproduction to then exploring and going to different places. Like, you know, one of the older civilizations or in the middle of the desert. So you, you can, now you can actually see the scale of that dune. You can see how massive it is. So these, these dunes are sometimes 300 and can go almost up to 400 meters high. They're massive. Now, in time, the photographer separated himself from standards created and in doing so became an artist. The mind and eye behind the camera could now concentrate on the uniquely individual view translated through technique into a print. So, now this is again shot in Namibia. And, um, you know, when you see it from, from a distance, this place I mean, it's still very, very interesting, but it's nothing compared to when you actually get down there. So it's just massive sand dunes. And then this little salt flat, which is opened up in the middle of it with these dead trees hanging there. They've been around for God knows how many thousands of years. So, um, and the moment you come down and you come close, then the imagery that you experience and the kind of stuff you see is so different. And simple translation from color to black and white. So again, you know how you play with tones, just the whole communication changes from there to there. Another shot of the aerial uh, perspective and um, just the way the landscape looks. Now, organizing the elements of a landscape scene for photography requires attention to lighting, viewpoint, and viewfinder cropping. Most of the pictorial tools, such as chiaroscuro, contrast, line, shape, form, texture, all contribute towards the monochrome landscape image. As you see here, uh, this is in the Valley of Wales, again, again in Egypt. Very, very few people have visited this place, but absolutely stunning. And again, you know, what you put into your frame is so important. I saw this little cloud literally coming out. I literally ran because I thought that, you know, it, it really looks like this rock here is thinking and that's the thinking cloud coming out of it or emanating from it. So I had to position myself immediately because the clouds were moving fairly quickly. And there's a window of just a few seconds to get the shot. And then again, the shadows making the shot as well. Again, let me be out. And then I'm going to talk about portraits. Now, taking a look at pictures of people is one of the most pervasive photographic pastimes. What makes photographs of people so fascinating? A constantly changing face is an almost totally kinetic subject that can be altered only with a photograph. Now, faces and bodies can provide endless design possibilities by themselves. Faces can provide fascinating texture and patterns. So, as you see here as well, you know, so you you are bringing in the environment, you, you see so much of the person and uh, it, it kind of tells you a whole story when, you, when you're shooting these kind of environmental portraits. Now figures in light or in silhouettes offer a wide variety of shape possibilities. Now people are also emotional subjects. We react to expressions, we 
lock onto the eyes staring out to us from a piece of paper or a screen nowadays. Now, if you look at this woman, if you, if you actually saw, you probably wouldn't be able to stare at her just the way you would when she's on a screen like this or, or looking at you through a print. And it gives you so much more information about her rather than just taking a glimpse and walking away. So you can see the kind of you know, jewelry that she's wearing, the way she's dressed up. Now, this is all um, in a place called Lakhpat, again in Kutch. Um, it's a whole tribe that stays there. And they, they, these are migrants from Afghanistan who actually live there. So, and this is somewhere deep into the heartland of Urissa. And we're just, um, sorry, not Urissa, this is Assam. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and this lady is really, really shy comes out, sits in the veranda, and she's got her pet coat. Comes in and gives her a little kiss at the moment she sits down. You just, you know, just, just capturing that, that moment. And you see, it's a slightly looser frame again to give you the environment of where she is. So despite the barrier of time, paper, chemical screens, we hope to establish contact with a person once held at the other side of the lens. So again, you know, stuff like this, uh, Images, uh, shooting portraits always can be a little intimidating and um, I've always got that from a lot of my students, you know, when you, when you send them out to take portraits, they're a little apprehensive, so they would rather take a, a much more bigger zoom and then zoom into them from a little distance and take a picture. Well, that's definitely one way of doing it. And the other is literally intimidating and going right in front of them with, with, with a normal lens or like an 80 or 85 mm lens and, uh, and shooting. And sometimes, you know, yeah, it is intimidating, but the moment you do that, you know, I think the the, the kind of um, imagery that comes out of that is so much more personal. And uh, again, this is this is you know you you dropping your inhibitions and and putting yourself in that place. And sometimes it can backfire, and sometimes people don't like it, and they might disperse you. But you know, you just you know, apologize, say sorry, and walk out. But I've seen more often than not, people, people love it the moment you engage them. Like you take a picture, if they're upset, you can show them the picture thanks to digital technology. You know, you just show, show it to them and they're so much more um, engrossed and they, they see themselves and everybody loves to see themselves. So, yeah, and then, then suddenly, you know, the whole, the whole tenseness is gone and they might actually even give you better shots. So it does, it does work quite well. Now, so when we look at a face, we see texture, a quality easily subdued by color. So the moment if it is shot in color, uh, you don't really tend to look at the, the textural quality of the face. And the moment it's black and white, I don't know if, if, if you get that, but I get that a lot. I, you really pay so much more attention to the expression, the emotion, the eye, and um, the texture on the face the moment it's black and white. And a few more examples of the environment. So I hope this has been uh, fairly useful um, in terms of you know, giving you a glimpse and an insight into, into black and white photography. And um, I'm probably am open to kind of taking questions now and um, you know, see if anyone, I'm just gonna leave this screen on and maybe Q and see what kind of questions are going uh, Himanshu, do you want to pick the yes. questions up from the WhatsApp group or it's also um, in the Q&A box? Okay, I can definitely take them. If you send me on the WhatsApp, yeah, I can definitely do that. Um, let me see. Yeah, I'll just put them in the Q&A box. Yeah, so I've got Mrunal Lamge. What will be your advice, suggestion for an amateur photographer like me to work upon to click excellent black and white photographs? Um, like clicking Candid and Nature. Thank you. Um, Brunal, um, I hope this, this uh, presentation has really, really helped you uh, and hopefully given you some sort of an insight on, you know, what you could do and how you would approach black and white photography. So, um, yes, to, um, to me, I think um, the first step, like I said, if, if, you're, if you're amateur and you're just starting out, the first step, like I pointed out, is probably fill, fill your frame with your subject. And that's, that's, the, that's the starting point. And then slowly, slowly start incorporating all the other things. But the most important thing to look out for is certainly contrast. So that would definitely be the way I would, I would approach uh, black and white photography, is to start looking out for contrast. And uh, honestly, there's, there's really no better way than to 
take a picture, go on to your screens and, uh, you know, work a little bit. I hope you're, you're a little, little more comfortable with, with uh, playing on the computer and uh, you can see a world of possibilities. Well, alternatively, you can come and learn from me whenever you want. That's easy. Um, what is the difference between taking a color picture and converting it to black and white versus taking a black and white which cannot be digitally converted? Um, great question, right there. Um, so today, digital photography has thrown so many possibilities at us. Now, I told you, you can actually convert to uh, black and white to view your image in black and white if you do want to. But I would always advise you to shoot in raw and in full color, not completely convert to black and white and discard color information. That, that is not the way to shoot it. Because if you shoot in, in color and in its raw state, it gives you far greater control when you're converting to black and white. So, um, you know, the, every color plays out a different tonal contrast. So if, um, and, and the more you practice and the more you understand this, uh, the clearer it will get why I'm saying this, but um, every color represents the tones in a very different shade of gray. So therefore getting the color information is such a huge plus with digital technology. And therefore you have far greater control on black and white images today than you had during the black and white, during the film days, for sure. Um, I hope that answers that. Um, could you tell us about using flash when shooting in black and white? Do you recommend it? Um, cool. uh, honestly, with today's uh, technology and the way it's advanced, bla uh, flash photography, I would really, really leave, leave it to an extremely specific kind of work. Uh, more often than not, I, I, I don't really play with uh, flash so much. Of course, in my commercial realm, I play a lot with flashes. But um, with all my travel work, I, I very, very rarely play with any kind of flash photography. Uh, with today, the way the ISO go up and you know you can shoot at such high ISOs, the sensor sensitivity towards light has, has become so much more powerful. Uh, you really, really don't really need to use flash at all. So I'm not, I'm not a big advocate of, of flash photography, especially when it comes to you know, capturing a mood, capturing an essence uh, in, in your general uh, you know, travel-based photography or hobby photography. So I hope that answers that. Uh, Dilip D'Souza, two things. One, you've spoken a lot about post and software processing. Is that a necessary part of black and white photography, you think? And two, if I shoot raw, but in black and white, you're saying the color is preserved in the raw image. Um, yes, in if you've shot raw, it is preserved for sure. Um, now coming to your first bit, yes, I have spoken a lot about post and software and processing because that's that's where technology is today. Um, which I would have spoken about had we been talking about film and darkroom, and I would have said uh, a lot of uh, of the play of contrast happens in the darkroom. That's what used to happen. Um, um, in the good old days. So uh, the difference being that the darkroom has literally come onto your screen today. That's the only difference. So you're not playing with the wet chemicals and all of that. But um, it's there and it's given you far greater control. So uh, yes, photography is a marriage between your camera and the software that comes with it. So you can't just say that, okay, I'm just going to take the picture and I'll leave it. Well, you could, but uh, then, you're not, then you're not exploring the full potential of your own vision of how you are seeing the image. So um, if you take it to an edit person, an edit person will do it according to their own aesthetic sensibility, or you will have to sit with them and guide them through the entire process and tell them exactly what you want. And if they are adept with their technology and they can, they can, they can service you in that space, then you may be able to get close to your vision. Uh, nothing better than doing it yourself. Um, and another reason why you're doing it yourself, because when you do it yourself and when you do the processing yourself, you learn so much more because then you realize, okay, you know, maybe had I shot this a slightly over or slightly under, my result would have been like that. So when you process it yourself, then when you're actually shooting, when you go back to shooting, you will be far better um, at handling your exposure, keeping the vision of what you want in post. So I hope that kind of makes sense to you. Uh, but yeah, I think it, it is definitely necessary. Um, 
Okay, Ankita, can this quality of pictures be clicked by a smartphone? Which camera is best for a beginner photographer? Well, um, you know, how much ever I'd like to, you cannot ignore the smartphone today. So yes, uh, uh, you can do a lot, lot with your smartphone. Um, today, I mean, uh, honestly, there's no particular brand that I would kind of uh, really advocate. But there are loads, loads of them. I mean, iPhone is fantastic. You have OnePlus, you have the Samsungs. Um, so all of them, all of them do, do a fairly good job. Um, Constraints, limitations, yes, they are. You, uh, if you're expecting to make extremely large prints, exhibition-based prints, gets a little difficult. So if they're smaller prints, yes, you'll, you'll get away with quite a bit. Uh, when I'm talking about you know, quality, detail, all of that. So, but does not mean that you can't make them large. And when you convert to black and white, it gives you that much more advantage to play with the, with the tones and, and the quality. So, Yes, you you can do a lot of work with a smartphone. So definitely you can. Um, Dr. Vishaka, could you elaborate on role of black and white photography in the field of fashion that predominantly revolves around color specific to the season? Um, let me also compliment you. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, uh, you know, very few fashion um, clients, I'd say, uh, would allow um, a photographer to, to shoot black and white campaigns. There have been a few, of course, in the past. Um, but uh, honestly, yes, people do, do tend to play it safe. It goes with the color scheme of the season and all of that. But um, if the client is willing to take that risk, I think black and white is a very, very powerful medium. And if you if you look up any of the black and white fashion campaigns, and you'll see, I mean, in the earlier days when, when there was no color and they shot in black and white. And some of the images you see from that era are just outstanding. So yeah, definitely. But yeah, it does it does depend on the client and how much freedom they are willing to give the photographer and the risk they're willing to take. And thank you once again for complimenting me on my images. Thank you. Gaurav, how does desaturation work when post-processing black and white photographs? Well, desaturation will just remove the color. That's what it will do. It will not really um, play with the contrast so much. So for that, then you will have to go into levels and curves and contrast and all of that. But um, yeah, post-processing, desaturation is just taking the color out. Now, tell us about black and white photography with color accents. What are the rules and principles of shooting and post-processing that apply to these kind of things? Um, yeah, well, that's a very popular medium as well. You know, just convert everything to black and white and retain a bit of color. Uh, done to death, I think, nowadays. Um, but yeah, in, in some images, it, it does justify it and, and can play a, a very, very strong role, undoubtedly. So it does, it does work. Um, what are the rules and principles of shooting? Honestly, there aren't any. I mean, it's, it's entirely up to you. Uh, a purist may argue and can say, oh, no, this is not pure photography. I'm, I'm not in that space. I think you can express whatever you feel, the way you feel. So no really rules to follow. But yes, you need to be good with your post-processing. You know, to select the color just in that much area and then to remove it from the rest of it. It does require a certain skill unless it's a very simple block element which you can kind of select. But uh, so yeah, a little bit of post-processing knowledge would help. Um, regarding texture in monochrome photography, how does one introduce and manipulate sharpness in a photograph? In the photograph of the bull, the details were extremely sharp, while another one with the monkey had rather soft details. How much of this is manipulated while taking the photograph, and how much of this is manipulated during the editing process and software? Great question. Uh, in both ways, um, requires a little bit of a lengthy answer. Though, uh, let me put it this way: um, the two subjects, so in the one you're talking about, the buffalo, which was really sharp and really grit in your face kind of a, an image. Um, that was shot broad daylight where the buffalo is getting considerable amount of light on, on him. He's full of mud. He's got that texture that, that really amplifies the whole grunge feel. So yes, I've played with contrast. That's about it. I really didn't need to do much more than that. Uh, and the one with the monkey again, it's a much softer image. 
as you rightly pointed it out, that's purely because no direct light is falling on the surface of the fur on the on the monkey's body. So it's completely back backlit and it's almost a silhouette, but it's just got this really soft because the light itself on that part is really, really soft. And that's what it's doing. So honestly, that's that's the difference. It's the quality of light that is falling on both the subjects that's made them so different. Um, honestly, if you've shot it sharp, you really don't need to do too much with the sharpness because the more you play with the sharpness, the more pixelated your image gets. So you do, really don't want to very, very minorly touch the sharpness areas. You don't really want to touch too much on the sharpness front in editing. Yeah, I hope that answers that. Uh, how has the genre of black and white photography evolved over time? With the advent of digital cameras and now the emergence of mirrorless cameras, etc. They have answered that fairly well, that you definitely have far greater control over black and white today than you had during the film days. And um, yes, the emergence of mirrorless cameras is just technology just constantly evolving and, and getting better and better. So it's just going to give you that much more control. Uh, Jilu, Billy Moria, what is an easy non-bulky camera to get that is not crazily expensive for a beginner? Well, that's going to be a little tricky because, well, the moment it's light, it gets heavy, unless it's a point and shoot. So if you're going into a serious camera, it, it is expensive. So, so bear with that, photography is an expensive one. Um, do we have more time, Asad? Can I take a few more? Uh, we have about two minutes left, Manshu. Okay. Okay. Uh, one more, uh, again, from an anonymous person. Who are some of your major idols and inspiration in the world of black and white? Oh, uh, quite a few. Ansel Adams to start with, Robert Mablethorpe. I mean, these guys were geniuses of their craft and their day. And uh, yeah, so technically, when, when I'm talking about technique and developing all this vision of black and white and seeing things, all of that, Ansel Adams, for sure. Absolutely brilliant. Um, how can it help effectively in fashion to create a product and brand differential? I think we already spoke about fashion earlier. Do you do the editing after conversion to black and white or some steps are required before conversion? Again, we've spoken a lot about editing and we've spoken a lot about that. You know, Jilu, how do you store your digital images so that you don't lose them in time? Cloud, cloud storage, that's the future, that's where it is. So uh, there are lots of cloud storage options. So that's what you want to do. Take the best, put them there. Um, and please get in the habit of deleting all the stuff that you don't want. That's equally important as well. Um, uh, is it possible to convey a light mode in a landscape photograph with a black and white photograph? It usually seems to convey a blank. If so, how to do so? Okay, which photography camera? Okay. So these are more generic questions. Um, you know, and landscape photo uh, photographs, I've shown you enough landscape photographs. I, I think you, you have seen enough of those. Some have a very mood and you know dark kind of an image, and some were fairly bright as well. So you know it's it's just how you play with the contrast eventually. So are we are we good, Asal? Yeah, I think you are. Thank you, thank yeah. you, Himanshu, for sharing. Thank you, Asal. I hope it's worth it. Uh, and perspectives on on photography. You know, I, I just for the uh, the people who've tuned in. I mean, you have to actually take part in one of Himanshu's photo safaris. I mean, it's it's an experience, and also he gives you a great opportunity to exhibit some yes. of the work <laughs> post. I've had the uh, good fortune of seeing many of these exhibits over the course of the few years, and the last one was on black and white photography, which I remember attending. Close to a year ago, a little over a year ago. Last year with with uh, Meraki, and that was uh, yeah. All all the people who traveled with me, they all got to that great show. Yeah, that was. That uh, was many fun. friends were part of it. We got to see their work. Absolutely. You know, I think uh, Avid had done this also a while back. Is even giving um, people who take part an opportunity to exhibit their work. Not only it gives you a sense of encouragement, but also gives you a sense of confidence and brings out your your perspective. Exactly. And and um, a direction photography. One quick question, Himanshu: The moon behind you yes. is that the same moon you used to combine the bird shot? No, no, no. no. Different That's moon. Same moon. It's a different moon. All right, sorry. Just, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a very curious question. Was, was short but, but thank you. Short thank action. you so much for doing this. What thank a you. great way to end Avid's uh, 2020. Yeah. You know, being such yeah. dark here. I mean, doing a black and white photography with such brilliant. <laughs> And a way to end this year is, is a highlight for us. 
I mean, the the audience, thank you for tuning in. What wonderful questions and so many. I mean, I think my man, your next program with you has to be a full day. It can't be an it can't be an hour. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this uh, meeting is a little new to me as well. You know, this online thing, and I'm so used to interacting with the crowd, so it just makes it a little bit easier. But yeah, ho ho hopefully, hopefully in 2021 yes. we'll have lots more interactions. As, as I can say, Himanshu, you can run, but you can never hide from Avid. <laughs> uh, and we will, we will be back pursuing you to do a, another, uh, another workshop. In fact, Himanshu's photo safari is uh, wildlife photo safaris are fabulous. Uh, we've done one of those also. Um, guys, stay tuned uh, for more programs for Avid Learning. Um, our next one is on documentary filmmaking on Saturday, 9th of January. Uh, we've got a very interesting, we've actually curated our programs for the first quarter. Um, and it's a very interesting mix of programs. So uh, do tune in, do uh, check us out on our website. All the information is out there or just stalk us on social media. <laughs> Until then, you know, season's greetings, best wishes for 2021. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy. And remember that learning never stops. Thank you so much, Himanshu. Such thank a you, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Team Abby. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you for participating, all the ones who were there. Thank you.